Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome again to another episode of On The Go with Ian Davidson, that's me. Um, last week or a couple weeks ago we had um, a person on Lenore Mollison, she was a guitar player. Um, a lot of people tuned in. I'd like to thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. And for all of the users that have tuned into the iTunes uh, and listened there too. Today we have um, a special guest, well, a guest for our show. Uh, we're really excited about Beatrice Cantelmo. 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 She is with the Amnesty International chapter here in Hawaii. And we're really excited to talk about the things that they're doing here. Um, let's get right into it. Hello, Beatrice. Oh, hello. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for being on, especially with short notice. <laughs> um, some people out there might know what Am Amnesty International is. Some people probably have these vague ideas just because they hear in the media or whatever these little Amnesty Aloha. International is doing this. Can you tell us just briefly what Amnesty International as an organization as a whole does? Yes, uh, so we are the largest uh, human rights grassroots organization on the globe. Uh, we started 55 years ago in London and now we have checked us pretty much uh, in every country well, most, most of the countries. Um, we are supported by 7 million uh, members, which are average people like you and I, uh, who not only pay membership, but also take human rights uh, very personally, because, you know, it impacts all of us. Um, so we have a chapter here in Hawaii. Uh, I think the first chapter was opened in the early 90s, and I was active, and then it got phased out. Um, and so 2014 was when I moved to Hawaii and we had a chapter uh, that was uh, restarting again and uh, so I began, you know, as a member and soon thereafter became the co-chair and then the chair. So the way Amnesty works uh, all over the globe, uh, including here in Hawaii, is that we look at uh, being agents of uh, social justice and human rights uh, um, advocacy and we do that through awareness um, when there are issues and concerns uh, of human rights violations uh, we usually do a very thorough job in terms of uh, um, documenting uh, those uh, concerns and also reporting on it uh, we also work a lot with uh, advocacy, and that is done in two ways. So one is educational opportunities, not only for the members, but also the community at large, and also uh, with state legislature. And then the second part of the way we promote change is through lobbying and advocacy for policy uh, evaluation and changes. And so that's what we're doing here in Hawaii. <laughs> okay, so you're physically going into the east state capital, all those places, and pushing for, s for change. Oh, absolutely. What is, here in Hawaii, I mean, you hear all the things, what is it the Hawaii chapter is up to, in particular? Let's say um, criminal uh, justice reform here in Hawaii. What are the things here in Hawaii that need reform? So, uh, the way Amnesty works, uh, we usually work within a frame uh, on either global or national uh, priorities. And so, as you mentioned, uh, criminal justice reform is a priority and uh, something that we're involved with, not just here in Hawaii, but also nationwide. So, this year, we started working more uh, at legislature to look at, at proposed bills that, uh, for example, the OCCC uh, budget uh, that's being proposed so that we build a new uh, prison facility. Uh, we don't believe we need that. And uh, there are all the social justice advocates that have been doing this work here in Hawaii for more than 20 years that, you know, supports the same way because uh, we look at uh, the amount of people who are incarcerated right now at OCCC, so it's like close to 1,400 people, that 999 of them, 999 of them uh, could be free because they really have very like small offenses. It's like class C felony or lesser type of offense. So there is no reason why we should be spending $145 a day, about $4,500 a month, $55,000 a year per person, uh, to incarcerate them where they could actually be uh, free and uh, that money could be allocated to rehabilitate them. 
So that's one of the conversations we I think that's started. very interesting because I've seen some of those numbers and it's pretty staggering the amount of people that are imprisoned here in Hawaii for many different reasons, but many of them are people that really didn't do very big of a, big of crimes. You know, these aren't like, they're not, the majority of them are like murderers or, you know, sh so you know what I mean? Like, it yeah. seems like we spend a lot of money, and there's, it's strange, because here in Hawaii, people like to talk about, you know, this costs us this, this costs us this, and not very many people talk about that. And so are you saying you're lobbying against making better, bigger, better prisons? Like, if we keep them smaller, is that what you're saying? We would like to actually uh, work in conjunction with other social justice advocates here in Hawaii, and not just look at uh, prison, and keeping it smaller, but really looking at a reform where it's not about uh, the culture of being punitive. Uh, it's really more of a culture of rehabilitation. Also, we need to look at who is in jail uh, in Hawaii. And uh, in the current l uh population, 38% uh, of them are Native Hawaiians or partially Native Hawaiians. And that is really quite an alarming number because what we see on the mainland in terms of over representation of minorities and uh, uh, incarceration because of overcharging uh, issues you know it's happening here so black lives matter movement uh, on the mainland that can be very easily translated into native hawaiian and pacific islander lives mirror yeah. so we really need to address and yeah, looking at statistics it, it doesn't seem to that hard to, of a jump to getting to the f to the we have prisons here solely to house Native Hawaiians mm -hmm. in some way or to sort of subjugate them to keep them down here in Hawaii. What do you say to people that that tell that say, oh, well, if we re re rehabilitate, they're just going to go back and do crimes again when we when they get out? What do you say to those people that are saying, you're you know? Well, I think we need to really uh, take a much broader look at our entire uh, system. It's not just the petty crimes, you know, you have to also look at what does it mean, you know, for somebody of, uh, you know, that comes from a risk uh, uh, community, not because of native, being Native Hawaiian, but because of poverty, perhaps, and lack of access to opportunities. Uh, since they're very little, and you know, I gotta look at uh, education. I gotta look at our housing situation. I gotta look at our living wages. Um, how does that translate, and how does that, you know, can be improved? Also, you know, in conjunction with criminal justice reform, because it's not just uh, working with our criminal justice system. It's really addressing the other layers that supports that. You know. So I would say that uh, we're not asking uh, in criminal justice reform uh, to let people free uh, if they have committed an offense. It's really about uh, rehabilitating in sense of restorative justice uh, in terms of helping them understand that their actions does have consequences. But instead of locking them up you know, in jail for a year, two, three, uh, put them in, co in solitary confinement, uh, that we really are investing in the person, that we're investing in education, that we're investing in counseling if there are issues with mental health or substance abuse or both. Uh, if there has been issues of chronic poverty, that we address that too. I would say that the money is here because if we can spend $55,000 to lock somebody up in jail, we could easily convert that money into really uh, addressing the core issues, you know, that would perhaps prevent somebody from, you know, uh, exploring, you know, criminal life, you know, as small as that may be. It's very interesting. All of these sort of topics that you touched on, those are sort of things that are occurring here and nationally. Mm -hmm. You did mention that Amnesty International does everything. You know, they're watching things, right? Like internationally and sort of on a larger scale here in America. Here in America, as you know, we've got Donald Trump. You've mentioned the word grassroots when you talk about Amnesty International. I think, or at least I do, when I think of the word grassroots organization, something like that, I think of the little man I'm thinking about people that don't have people, you know, people that are fighting for people that may not have someone there to fight for them, watchdogs, if you will. 
right now like in America, I think people are afraid of the things that Donald Trump and the administration might do f to those people because traditionally, well, and you know, their views, Republican views are, who cares about the little man? Ultimately, they'll figure it out themselves. So I suppose, and you know, and all the things that Donald Trump has said, I suppose it's pretty easy to assume that Amnesty International has probably got some sort of thing going on to watch the things that he's up to? Oh, absolutely. We actually are quite active. Even though we are a bipartisan uh, organization, and by that we mean we don't really uh, support one political party over the other because we believe it's important that we work with both parties. Uh, as soon as uh, Trump administration came into power, and uh, we started seeing the new executive orders uh, that were issued to address immigration and refugee uh, and, and anti-Muslim uh, uh, mandates. Amnesty was right there. And uh, so we issued a lot of campaigns uh, you know, in every state uh, to urge members and allies to come together in solidarity and in action. So what that means for us here in Hawaii, um, and it was quite an organic process because uh, we have ACLU, we have the Muslim Association, we have several churches, we have several social justice organizations that were very concerned about the same issues. So in January, we came up with a joint statement uh, to our Attorney General and to our state addressing those issues and say we're really concerned and we don't want uh, this to be something that we want to support as a state. These are not Aloha values, these are not our values in our community. And soon thereafter, a new coalition was formed and it's called uh, Hawaii Coalition on Civil Rights. So that coalition is comprised of 30, uh, I think 32 uh, social justice organizations now. And, uh, and so we are looking at ways that together we can address what's happening with Trump administration. So within two months, so much has happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm so proud to say that, you know, we have an attorney general that, you know, is quite on board with what needs to be done here. Uh, we had a federal judge, Watson, last week that at the very last hours, you know, of the new executive order review being in effect, saying, no, I don't think so, not under a watch. And we took a lot of scrutiny for that, you know, being Hawaii. But um, that's the part of the people. It's not the social justice organizations. We are listening to the people. And just to give you an example, when uh, the second review was issued, uh, Amnesty International have put uh, a, a post on our website on Facebook uh, asking our constituents here and our members and allies to connect with our Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard and uh, Senator Schatz and uh, uh, him, him Muro, and ask them to pretty much uh, oppose to these new measures. And uh, within four hours, we had close to 500 viewers and uh, six hours later, we actually got a note from uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard uh, in our own site saying, okay, we have issued a statement and that uh, Tulsi Gabbard is opposing uh, you know, to these uh, new ordinances. And then uh, uh, it, it was just really powerful to see that it was not just an organization, it's the people, the grassroots piece of you know the average person who will see something and say, what can I possibly do to make a, a difference? Well, your voice matter, and uh, together we're stronger. And within the day, we had 750 people who saw that. Uh, yesterday also was a very big day for Hawaii because uh, we, are now, we now have a measure that's in effect. Uh, 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 state legislature have approved that with amends that we are uh, a welcoming state, the whole, uh, whole Pika state. I'm, I'm sorry if I have mispronounced it, my Hawaii <laughs> language is not that good. But what that means is that not only we are uh, you know, reassuring not only members of our community uh, you know, who are Native Hawaiians and they come from all over the globe, uh, whether they're here as residents or visiting, that we are a safe state. But also this uh, measure addressed something very important which has to do with federal immigration laws 
uh, under the new Trump administration, uh, there is one segment of immigration law uh, that would uh, allow for uh, local police uh, to be deputized and work with ICE and do the job uh, of, you know, immigration uh, police. And the state of Hawaii said, no, we don't want to do that. Not only we cannot afford fiscally, but it would be something very unfair uh, to those who are here for several reasons. But, you know, it's very important that as, as a state, you know, we were able to make uh, a verbal commitment in writing, in our laws, in our bylaws, saying that we protect and we respect and we honor everybody who is here, regardless of their immigration status. And that uh, this uh, measure also allows for um, people who may commit a crime to, you know, also be. Uh, accountable for it but without targeting them without the racial profiling that our current uh, government administration at a federal level is trying to push so you know it's quite amazing i think in terms of you know how much we have been you know hit in these last months to see people coming together and saying Maybe alone we can't do much, but together we do have a voice. Look at what happened today. Obamacare mm -hmm. is still I know. in it, a fact. It is quite amazing at what <laughs> yeah. the power of people can do. And uh, one of the things, you know, all of those things you were just talking about in the past few months here in Hawaii, and you should see some of the vicious things people have written on our YouTube page on the topics when we've touched on these things. And there's some pretty scary stuff out there thinking a lot of it's blustery, you know, it's just they don't know, but I, to be quite honest, I'm very proud of the way that Hawaii has sort of taken a stance at trying to be at the forefront of something, of maybe something right. It's really cool. Sure. we got to take a break. Okay. Please stand by. We're going to talk about uh, consensual sex workers and some stuff that's going on in Okinawa. Uh, this is On The Go. I have uh, Beatrice Ken Kalmala from Amnesty International Hawaii chapter here. Uh, we'll be right back after this message. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and look forward to seeing you at Education Matters on Tuesdays with me, Carol Monley. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversation. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be, but I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. We're back to On The Go. I'm Ian Davidson, the host. We were just talking about some of the stuff that's gone on in um, healthcare today. The sort of, basically, the announcement that Obamacare is, land, is law of the land. I thought that was really cool. Did you see that? I think that yes. that's really cool. You know, basically everything that people have fought for, and I'm sure you fought for, um, it's a big one. Change is coming. Uh, excited about that. We were just talking about some of the things that internationally, or interne Amnesty International takes care of. Sorry about that. Sure. Um, there's a few things that I'm interested in that we've talked about. Let's talk about consensual sex worker here, and particular in Hawaii. But before you get into that, I find it quite interesting that culturally we're now talking about this kind of stuff. Like it's it's something. It's a change I think is kind of good. Just I, I mean I know that it's a con the the idea is pretty hard fought. Both sides kind of have ideas on this topic. But I wanted to point out that I think it's quite interesting that culturally people can now talk about consensual sex work without getting all crazy. In the uh, most recent Hawaii Business Magazine, there was a whole article about professional cuddlers. And I know that that is, a, is sort of the same sort of, sort of thing, people paying for an emotional connection or something like that. Maybe you can set me straight on this. But I thought it was interesting that in a mainstream magazine, they're talking about sex work in a way that isn't bad or isn't criminal. Tell me about what consensual adult sex work is. So 
This was actually the first campaign that Amnesty International have I achieved and got involved with. That's really what our members uh, back in 2015 wanted to work on. Uh, and that year, our legislation uh, was going through a lot of uh, change where um, unfortunately for our state it did not make uh, the lives of adult consensual sex work uh, um, any easier. In fact, the current laws that we have criminalizes them quite heavily uh, for several reasons. One, our state uh, laws and uh, the policies, they have conflated, meaning they bundled up and they now uh, consider uh, sex work, whether it is coerced sex or whether it is uh, trafficking and prostitution as the same categories, and they are not. And so uh, we had Amnesty International USA legal team looking at uh, our proposed laws back in 2015 and making a statement uh, supporting a good parts of the legislation that was being proposed and also pointing out the human rights violations issues. So uh, back in 2015, Amnesty International have just finished uh, their groundwork investigation and reporting globally on uh, the human rights violations of uh, uh, adult consensual sex workers when they are uh, uh, exposed to a criminalized system where their trade and their uh, themselves, you know, are just pretty much put out there, you know, as criminals. So here in Hawaii, pretty much if you are an adult consensual sex worker and uh, you have somebody uh, uh, searching for your services, that person is considered a trafficker, not just a client. Yeah. Uh, and the person who is providing the sex work, uh, they have two choices if they get arrested. Either they say, yes, I was doing adult consensual sex work, and then they get charged with being you know, a trafficker as well. Or they can say, I am a victim of uh, sex trafficking, which is not accurate either. But uh, that's pretty much the choices that they're given. Also, the other thing that our laws have is that it allows for law enforcement to, to do sting operations where they can have sexual contact with a potential client, uh, sex worker, you know, posing it to be a client, arrest them afterwards and be completely exempt from any uh, consequence uh, and because they were in the line of duty and that is uh, as bad as like what, what some of the laws that are happening you know in China so that's where we at so to answer your question uh, really by the United Nations uh, definition of, of uh, trafficking adult consensual sex work is not considered uh, trafficking and it's not considered a uh, coerced sex so in order to be considered adult consensual sex work, it has to be uh, a sexual arrangement between a, a consenting adult. They have to be over the age of 18. And uh, it has to be of their own will. And, uh, and whatever happens between them, it's really their business. So it is a business transaction. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, there is a lot of issues with that too in our society because we talk about it, but not really. Sex right. is a big taboo. A There's the religious one. aspect of it. There's the shame and the stigma attached to it as well. It's a tricky one. I found it quite interesting consensual. You know, people probably first think prostitutes. That's not really, not, it's, you're not just necessarily a prostitute because you choose to do this. This is the other business. I think, what do you say to people that instantly go to, oh, it just leads to this crime or this crime there, just put it all together. And what would you say to somebody that might say, um, um, you know, the idea of trafficking and the bundling up, it's wrong. So, I think it's quite interesting because part of why I think Amnesty carries a lot of uh, credibility in this process, we just don't go there and say, oh, you know, we're just going to go and support this because it looks, you know, cool or because, you know, we just feel like compelled to do so. We have to do a lot of report and a lot of studies, you know, to be able to support our position. Uh, so the largest organization that supports uh, anti-trafficking uh, uh, education and advocacy on the globe, which is the Global Alliance 
uh, women against trafficking, and they serve over 90 countries. Uh, they, and this has been like 20 years of work that they've been doing in this field, that they have come to the conclusion that actually by criminalizing adult consensual sex work, uh, you're actually increasing the ability of uh, perpetrators to actually traffic people. Uh, in which ways? Uh, you know, if, if you are actually afraid of law enforcement and you know that they will come to you to penalize you, it is uh, less likely that you're going to come forward to say that you're being abused by perhaps an employer or a client, or if you have seen an activity that is really more like in alignment with trafficking, you're not going to report. Right. It also gives much more room for this type of tra the trafficking piece of it to run underground, uh, and because it's hidden and it's you know it's something that there is not much leverage for people to you know to really do much about it. Uh, but the other part too is that I think people really have to start working with the unlearning process and being able to separate what trafficking means from coerced you know, prostitution, from consensual prostitution. We call it sex work actually mm. because that's what it is, it is work. Uh, and, uh, and so once you're able to see the differences uh, and you're able to handle it differently, I think then that there is a counterculture of, of change to within our own laws, where law enforcement are trained to differentiate all three parts. Um, you know, from an amnesty standpoint, we do not support trafficking whatsoever uh, in any way, shape, or form. We do not support uh, commercial sex done by uh, anyone under the age of 18. Um, and so, you know, we really have a big commitment to, you know, prosecute and also to criminalize criminals, you know, that commits crimes against people because they're either forcing someone or because they are doing that, you know, with a minor. But in the case of an adult who is, you know, doing adult consensual sex work, we have to also protect their rights. Uh, and it's not just their right to walk, it's their right to safety, it's their right to access to health. Mm -hmm. uh, because once you are criminalized, it's less likely that you're going to seek uh, health uh, services because you're afraid that your information is going to be shared with law enforcement. So then you have to look at STIs and HIV, uh, uh, you know, percentage beyond the rise. Uh, you also have to look at what does it mean to have a criminal uh, record for actually doing something that's consensual and that's not considered a crime by the United Nations. It's wild. So, you know, like if you really try to talk to someone, look, I don't support prostitution, you can do something different. Or well, the first part of it is decriminalize it. Because once you do that, then you have to address all the issues, which is like what kind of options are you really providing to people who may wish to live uh, the field, but you know, financially, it makes a lot of sense for them to continue to be there, so that they can support themselves and their families. And they are making actually a choice as an adult to say, "I'm going to do this." Right. Uh, it's not that they are being forced to do it. So uh, you know, you have to look at this, you know, from several angles, and uh, so that's one thing that we've been doing now for two years. And uh, uh, we had the two new bills that were introduced. Uh, um, and Amnesty actually provided a, a statement in support of that would decriminalize uh, uh, sex workers in the state of Hawaii and also would expunge their criminal record you know, from previous years that they have been uh, arrested for practicing you know, their job. And uh, so the bills were not killed, which is a good news, but it was also not hard this year. So we'll have a year. The good news is that we have a year to work with our state legislature to educate them about what is it that we're asking of them uh, in terms of you know, all of these reforms. And uh, that's where I think we can play a big role as Amnesty is through education and also work with the grassroots piece of it where sex workers can hopefully come forward and also talk about their own experiences, not only by being criminalized, but also about their job, their trade. There are other states in this country that they actually have sex workers, associations and organizations and cooperatives. And uh, 
they are doing you know a lot to protect one another and to support each other so hopefully that will also move forward here in Hawaii well, hopefully you know these things take time and, I, yeah, and you know these does. things aren't going to happen overnight yeah, and like yeah. I was saying culturally there's our shifting as much as I'd like to talk about this forever we have sort of run out of time oh. it goes fast yeah it's they're telling me in my ear cut it off, cut no. it off. but before we do, I do. There was one other topic I want so, to talk about. People talk about, you know, political prisoners in other countries all the time. We talk about people here in America. You know, the big names, the Chelsea Manning, you know, Snowden. These are sort of political people that are prisoners of their own selves for things that they've done, that things that they've done that they felt they were doing or are doing for the right reasons. I did want to. You did mention to me just short, quickly, if you could just mention the person's name in Okinawa that is standing up against American bases being moved in there and is subsequently incarcerated by the Japanese government. Yes, so that's uh, Mr. Hiroshi Yamashiro. Uh, he's a 64-year-old peace activist, uh, and uh, he was doing peaceful assembly and uh, protest against the expansion of a U.S. military base in Okinawa when he was arrested in 2015, no, 16. Uh, and then uh, he's been denied bail, uh, even though th really the Japanese uh, Supreme Court does not have much grounds to keep him in, under custody. And uh, so Amnesty has issued a global urgent alert, uh, not only to educate people about you know, his human rights that are being violated, uh, and to ask that he be free immediately, but that he also be allowed to uh, have medical uh, assistance and also to be able to see his family, which he's not allowed to. And also that, you know, the Japanese government uh, and uh, the world in general also look at the rights of people of free assembly and to be able to speak freely about things that they believe in and not being persecuted for that. So uh, we thought that Hawaii would be a very wonderful place to be able to bring that level of awareness because of the ties that we have with Japanese and Okinawa cultures, you know, that we have many members of the Okinawan uh, um, community and also the Japanese uh, you know, community living here in Hawaii and also the history that we have with militarism uh, that is not very different from what has happened, you know, and is happening in, in, in Okinawa. So uh, Interesting. the conversation uh, the, will continue we'll, yeah, to we must, we, We'll have to talk about yeah. this some more. There's stuff going on all around the world, and watch, watch. Go out there and Google some stuff. Check out Amnesty International, what they're doing. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for Thank being you. on. I appreciate you for tuning in. This has been On The Go. If you're listening on the podcast, watching on YouTube, subscribe, tell a friend, all that good stuff. Uh, see you next time. Aloha.